uh, emphasize they sat in the middle gate and he gives the name of these particular uh, princess. And then he says that Zedekiah the king and all the men of the war saw them. They fled, went out of the city by night, trying to run away by the king's garden. And he went out by way of the plain, but the Chaldean army pursued them and overtook him in the plains of Jericho. Jericho was about, oh, it, we remember and you think about the idea that it was about two or three miles away from uh, Jerusalem. Jericho was later days, mainly a priestly city. So we, we keep that in mind. And so he didn't get very far. They seized him and then uh, they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar. Now, again, remember Nebuchadnezzar was defeating and, and attacking them again because Zedekiah had listened to very bad advice, had stopped giving uh, Nebuchadnezzar the tariffs and everything that Nebuchadnezzar wanted. So he says, I'm, I'm done with this. I'm going to punish these people. And that's the way it is. And so whenever he catches um, Zedekiah, the last thing he does, verse 6, chapter 39, he killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And the king of Babylon killed all the nobles of Judah. So the last thing he's seen before he is blinded is the death of all the nobles as well as his son. And then he burned the king's house, burned the houses of the people with fire broke down the walls of the city of Jerusalem and Nebuzaradan carried him captive into Babylon, the remnant of the people who remained in the city, those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. And obviously this is where to get our ideal of it, he had taken the, the captives while awaiting for everybody to go back down to Babylon. He had taken the captives to a place called Ribla, which was outside the city of Jerusalem, north of the city of Jerusalem, about 10 or 11 miles. So, all that he did after that, he left the poor, the poor people who had nothing and gave them the vineyards and the fields at the same time. <clears throat> then we have chapter 39, verse 11, Jeremiah goes free. He mm -hmm. gave charge concerning Jeremiah to the captain of the law, make, him, make sure you do him no harm, do just as what he says to you. And obviously Nebuchadnezzar had heard about Jeremiah's prophecies had heard how Jeremiah had tried to the very best of his ability to um, encourage the people to go ahead and surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, just think about how things might have been so different. The city itself would not have been torn down. Uh, it may be that he may have allowed certain of the people to stay there like he did even after this place was torn apart. Um, so they took Jeremiah from the court of the prison committed him to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, that he should take him home, and he dwelt among the people. Again, remember his home would have been Anatoth, which was about two or three miles north, and it was a city of the, it was a priestly city. And then he says this promise to verse 16, Ebi, Ebad, me like the Ethiopian. He said, I will bring my words upon the city for adversity, but I will deliver you in that day, and you shall not be given to the hand of the men of whom you are afraid. So, you have two or three things happening. Number one, the king Zedekiah was going to be taken into captivity after he was blinded. Uh, Jeremiah was set free, and uh, Ebad Melech the Ethiopian. Uh, we mentioned him and talked about him earlier in Jeremiah 38, mm -hmm. verse 7. And so he says, I'll bring my words on this. And he says, uh, Your life will be your prize to you because you put your trust in me. So this sets up everything that's going on in chapter 40, where he continues to talk about what's going to happen to Jeremiah now. So verse chapter 40 says, uh, after this, uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the captain of the guard had let him go from Ramah. I'm sorry, I said Ribla, but I was Ramah. When he had taken him bound in chains among all those who were carried away captive, who were carried away captive to Babylon. So obviously, whenever they sacked the city, they took put Jeremiah in chains after they had released him from the prison that he had been in under Zedekiah's rule, taking him to Ramah, and then whenever Nebuchadnezzar comes back up there where Rama is, and probably that's where Rama, where Nebuchadnezzar had his base of operations in that whole city or in that whole area, mm -hmm. he met Jeremiah and uh, released him. There are, and some commentaries suggest the fact that there was a possibility that in 597, when Nebuchadnezzar came down, that he had heard of Jeremiah before then. I mean, had heard of what Jeremiah was doing, how Jeremiah was preaching that they should give up and, and surrender to the Babylonians. 
uh, he may have even met him by that time. Uh, so there is that possibility that he may have met Jeremiah before. <clears throat> and then in this last event, uh, about uh, 11 years later, uh, he finally sees him again and said, okay, I'm going to leave it up to you. You choose yeah. what you want to do. And I think it says a lot about, uh, again, this commentary that I've encouraged you to buy, emphasize the idea. What's interesting is Jeremiah's own people put him in prison. Nebuchadnezzar said, you're free. You can do what you want to do. <laughs> Irony of ironies. <laughs> that, uh -huh. that's just, that is exactly what it was going on there. So he says, um, he says, now you've got your choice. What are you going to do? He says, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it's good for you to come with me to Babylon, I'll look after you. But if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain here. All the land is before you. It seems good and convenient for you to go, go there. And one of the things that I did point out was the fact that Jeremiah makes the decision to stay there. Yeah. I think there's two reasons. Number one, we do know that Ezekiel had gone in that second wave. It's very possible that Daniel had gone to Babylon in that first wave. So you've already got two prophets preaching to the people back in Babylon. And Jeremiah makes the decision to stay to hopefully give some courage and help to the people that are going to be left there in Jerusalem. And I think that's, that's what his thinking was in behind all of that. So Jeremiah goes and he, he says, go back to Gedaliah and uh, Gedaliah becomes the governor over the cities of Judah. And he says, you do what you want to, but that's it. So he goes to Gedaliah and he dwells among the people who were left in the land. Now who were left again, going back to chapter 39, it was those poor people that had absolutely nothing. It was those that had, you know, out of all of this, and think about in a time of war, in a time of battle, in a time of things like this, it's the poor people that hurt and suffer the worst. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also extremely interesting that Nebuchadnezzar, in, in this particular context, watches out for them. Okay, we're going to leave you here. If that's what you want to do, we're going to leave you here. But you'll have all the vineyards, you'll have all the fields, you'll have everything that you need to take care of yourself. So it may be afterwards that as a result of that, they would have been blessed even more. And could it again have had reference back to Leviticus, where God gave a command that the children of Israel were to always take care of the poor? And because they weren't doing that, isn't it ironic in another respect that God allowed the poor of the land to stay in the land? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh while he sent the rich people that weren't taking care of the people off into captivity. So I think as you're looking at this, sometimes we think, think to ourselves, all right, well, he just took them into captivity and that was, that was the end of it. But no, there's a lot of other things going on here. And a lot of it goes back to the retribution and what Jeremiah had been talking about all along, you need to be doing what God has been telling you to do. Yeah. They didn't. So this is how it's going to play out. Those that are poor that have not been taken care of, they're going to take care of themselves now because they've got all the stuff that you're not going to be able to take with you. So ironic. Yeah. Uh, but that's the way God handles things. And I, I, I love the way he does that. God, uh, I preached a sermon years ago. God gets us out of reverse. So we think it ought to go this way. And God says something totally different. So that's a, that's a great lesson in and of itself. He goes and dwells in verse chapter 40, verse six with the Gedaliah. And when all the captains of the armies who were in the field heard that the king of Babylon had made Gedaliah, they committed to him women, children, men, the poorest of the land who had not been carried away captive. And then they all came to Gedaliah. And this is where we begin to see this. Ishmael, the son of Nethaniah, Johanan and Jonathan, Sariah and the sons of Ephi the Nephilite, and Jezaniah, the son of Amalekite, and Gedaliah had all of these people supposedly helping him, but before it's over with, and you already know this, it's Ishmael who's going to kill Gedaliah. Yeah. Ishmael's going to kill Gedaliah, and they're going to create a greater problem. So he says, do not be afraid. Gedaliah said, do not be afraid to serve the Chaldeans, dwell in the land, serve the king, and it'll be well with you. And I will dwell at Mizpah and serve the Chaldeans who come to us. Gather wine, some of fruit and oil, put them in your vessels, dwell in the cities. And <clears throat> when all the Jews who were in Moab and Ammonites and Edom 
Now, again, remember the ideal of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, Moab, um, and Ammon were the descendants of Lot through his daughters. Uh, Edom was the descendants of Esau. So just kind of keep that. That helps and he always keep that in mind. So they head out west, no, excuse me, a little bit east where this area was, Moab and Ammon and so forth. When they heard that the king had left a remnant and they had said over them, get then all the Jews came back out of the places from where they had driven. So now you not only have the poor, but now you have all these others who were driven out. And they notice, he said, they gathered wine and summer fruit in abundance. So those that were left, again, are being richly blessed. And he says, do you know that, uh, Johanan says, do you know that uh, Balas, the king of the Ammonites, has sent Ishmael, the son of Nethamiah, to murder you? But Gedaliah did not believe. Put it, from the, as we think about Gedaliah's thinking, I'm not there and obviously wasn't in his brain, but obviously he had just thought, look, the Babylonians had just conquered everybody, okay? There's nobody here left. There's no threat here anymore. And, and you're now saying that uh, this king of the Ammonites, which Nebuchadnezzar has obviously had dealings with all along, you telling me that he's sending this guy to kill me. I don't believe that. I think he had this, this false sense of security because... He, he thought well, nobody's even going to think about it because of I am the governor left by the king who defeated all of these countries. Yeah. And yeah, you know, and I think it, how often do we make the same? No, that's not going to happen. No, that's not going to be a big deal. Uh, you know, and, and comes back and bites us every time. Right. <laughs> it does to me anyway, sometimes it's like, no, it's not going to be as bad as I think. And then it turns out to be worse than I think. So anyway, I think that's what he's doing there. And so the Bible says that he got 80 men with their beards shaved. Well, Ishmael has struck down all the Jews with Gedaliah. And on the second day after he had killed Gedaliah, there were men, 80 men who had their beards shaved and their clothes torn, having cut themselves with offerings and incense in their hands to bring them to the house of the Lord. Now, verse five is an interesting idea. They had come from Shiloh, from Samaria. We remember the idea, Leviticus 19, 17, uh, that they were not to cut the corners of their ears. So it seems like they weren't supposed to cut their beards off. Yeah. As I've read through the text, I think that made them as, uh, that people. But perhaps the only time you ever really read in people where they're cutting their beards off or tearing their clothes is whenever they are mourning over something. So here right. these guys come in, they're mourning, and they had this gift to give, bring to the house of the Lord. Ishmael saw them, brought them out in the midst of the city, killed them. And 10 women were found among them who said to Ishmael, do not kill us. We have treasures of wheat, barley, and oil. And he did not kill them among their brethren. So the pit into which Ishmael had cast all the dead bodies of the men he had slain because of Gedaliah was the same one, Asa the king. Now he's going back here to 1 Kings 15. Yeah. This is, it's interesting how the Bible will reference things back over and over and over again. And this is back in the time of Asa. So Ishmael carried away captive all the rest of the people, the king's daughters, the people that remained there. And with whom the Bazaradan had done and Ishmael carried them away captive and departed to go over to the Ammonites. So he's heading out. Yeah. And he's running because he knows that what he's done is wrong. And he's probably thinking, we got to get out of here as quick as we can. Um, so because of the efforts of this man, they're, they're not going to have any government or anything like that. So Johanan, the guy that warned Gedaliah that Ishmael was going to kill him, he took all the men, went to fight with Ishmael. They found him by the great pool and they saw Johanan. Then they were glad. And the people that were carried captive, they were glad. All the people whom Ishmael had carried away captive turned around and came back and went to Johanan. And Johanan and all the captains of the forces took from Mizpah all the rest of the people that he had recovered from Ishmael. They killed Ishmael and um, they then began to go on. Now, that's pretty well what we covered about the last week. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now we're coming on into chapter 42. And 
you, you've got all these people that are left and they're looking around and, and I try to picture in my mind what it must've looked like. Yes, the summer fruit and the vines are, are bearing fruit and there's not as many people to feed this with. So yes, they've got plenty of food, but they kind of look around in the city of Jerusalem, there's a smoldering heap of stones torn out. I picture dead bodies laying in the middle of the street. I, I picture all the work that's going to have to be done to bury those people. Mm -hmm. uh, you could just imagine that whenever you have this kind of thing, there's disease that becomes rampant. Um, you have dogs running around. Uh, it's probably, as I envision it as much as I possibly can, a stinking, smoldering mess mm -hmm. that's not going to get better until they get all, at least all the body. Let's not even talk about rebuilding now. Let's talk about just trying to get rid of all the bodies that are laying around. Mm -hmm. And again, in Lamentations, as I said earlier, <clears throat> Jeremiah is going to be walking around. And he's going to be seeing this and he, he's just going to be weeping at everything he sees here. So they sit back and they, they said to Jeremiah, okay, listen, let our petition be acceptable to you and pray to us, to the Lord, your God. I find that interesting. There are many occasions in the Bible where you have God's people, the Jews actually coming up to prophets and some others and say, pray to the Lord, your God. And it's not like yeah. he's not our God. He's your God. And I've always, every time I do that, I kind of circle that, like, and that says a lot about what you believe about your relationship with God. And that also says a lot about your, your feelings about your relationship with God. He's your God. He's not mine. I'd rather serve something that I could see, uh, an idol uh, or something along that line. So uh, I, every time I read that phrase, it always just kind of just jumps out to me whenever I'm seeing it. He says, Notice he said, pray to us for the Lord, your God, that the Lord, your God may show us the way in which we should walk in the thing we should do. And it's like Jeremiah's, I picture that commercial and, and you may have seen it where somebody asks another person the, the ultimate stupid question and their eyes just roll in their head. It's kind of like, really? Uh -huh. You've been around, heard me all this time, and I've been trying to tell you that you need to get back to doing the commandments that God had given you, and now you want me to tell you that again? Uh -huh. uh, it didn't work out too well for you all along, <laughs> and now what's changed? Oh, the city's ransacked. Now, are you going to change? Uh -huh. um, no, I don't think so, but <laughs> all right, uh -huh. all right. Now, and, and he says, that the Lord your God may show us in the way we should walk and the thing we should do. And I'm just like shaking my head, rolling my eyes. Really? Really? Okay. Yeah. Then Jeremiah said to them, I have heard, I will pray to the Lord, your God. Notice he says, I will pray to the Lord, your God. He's your God, guys. It's not just mine. He's yours. I will pray to the Lord, your God, according to your words. And it shall be that whatever the Lord answers you, I will declare it to you. I will keep back nothing from you. And again, I love his attitude here. Number one, I'm hearing what you're saying. Number two, and I just vision him saying, I will pray, but it's not like I haven't been praying all along. I will pray to the Lord, your God. And then he says, whatever the Lord says, I'll tell you. Um, that's what I've been doing all along. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's why I love studying Jeremiah, because I think some of us as preachers, we, we hear this stuff sometimes, and it's like, where have you been? <laughs> uh -huh. That's what I've been talking about. And, and really? You haven't got it yet? <laughs> what more is it going to take? Uh -huh. You know? Am I going to have to do miracles, which I can't do, but maybe if I make the PowerPoint a little bit flashier or something, maybe uh -huh. you'll get it. I don't know, man. <laughs> but I tell you what, I'm going to pray for you. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to pray for you. All That's not going to stop. <laughs> and, and so, I, as, as I said, I, that's why I love studying Jeremiah, because he just really, to me, he just really makes this 
hilarious in one sense, but it's also sad because yeah. when you're seeing what all is going on at that moment in time. And so he said, I'll keep back nothing from you. So they said, let the Lord be a true and faithful witness between us. Okay, you're going to get God as a witness between us. Mm -hmm. If we do not do according to everything which the Lord, your God, sends us by you. So we're, we're, we're going to get on your side. And everything God has told you to tell us, we will do it. And you know, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. Right. It's not going to happen. Nope. <laughs> you, you've not done it up till now. It's not going to happen now. Whether it is pleasing or displeasing, we will obey the voice of the Lord. Our, now notice verse six. We will avoid the, obey the voice of the Lord, our God, to whom we send you, that it may be well with us when we avoid the voice of the Lord, our God. So it's extremely interesting that they've been saying, you're God, you're God. And then uh -huh. Jeremiah just knows he's your God too. And now there's, now it's like, okay, we'll buy into this idea that he's our God. Uh -huh. As I see that, I see people wishy-washy. I see people one moment saying one thing and then the next moment saying something else. They're going, a lot of things going through their mind, trying to figure out, okay, is this going to be true or not? Is this going to be worth what we're doing? And as we said, we know the rest of the story. After yeah. 10 days that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, he called Johanan and all the captains of the forces which were with him and all the people from the least, even to the greatest, and said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. You've been calling him your God. You've been calling him my God. You've been, no, he is the God of Israel to whom you sent me to present your petition, if you will still remain in the land, I will build you and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. For I relent concerning the disaster that I have brought upon you. Sometimes this word relent, in the New King James Version is translated <laughs> And so it suggests the idea that God changes his mind this has still been all, in, 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 as I look at it, it's still all a part of what God had meant all along. Uh -huh. And my will has always been to bless you. Yes. Your will is not to obey me. Therefore, I have to punish you. By the way, this is what I said in uh, Leviticus 16, Deuteronomy 26. I've said uh -huh. this. I've said this. I've given prophets. I've done all this other stuff. I will do that. But... You choose not to obey, so that's the reason why you were pulled down. But if you stay here, uh -huh. I'll bless you. I'll, I'll let you stay here, and I'll bless you. I will not pull you down. And he said, don't be afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not be afraid of him. <clears throat> you're afraid of him. I know you're afraid of him. Don't be afraid of him anymore. I am with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. So again, God, as he does when he, and, and to me, as I'm looking at this, I see the covenant motif again that you yeah. read in Deuteronomy where he says, okay, if you just trust in me, if you just do what I say, he's not going to harm you. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bless you. How often does God do that through the, through the Old Testament? I will show you mercy that he may have mercy on you and cause you to return to your own land. So God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to let you return. But if you say, see, God knew their hearts. It's not like he hadn't heard this time again. <laughs> and over the, over the centuries, mm -hmm. since the time they had left Egypt, he has heard this over and over and over and I guess the thing that always amazes me is, as I've shared before, is God's amazing grace and God's long suffering. I mean, just, just, mm -hmm. just dealing with that. You know, I don't have that much long suffering to where you, you do this to me time after time, after time, after time, after time, after time. 
and then I punish you for it. And then you're like, okay, well, you know, and then you promise me to do it. You're going to straighten up and then you do it again and again. I can't even begin to wrap my mind about that around how God is that merciful and how merciful and gracious he is and all of that. Perhaps that's what we need to be preaching more and more, God's long suffering, but always emphasizing the idea. And to me, this is a, something that, that you see from Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and these other passages. There comes a point when God says enough's enough. I'm, I can't deal with it anymore. So as I've stated before, we need to preach God's grace. We need to preach his mercy. We need to preach his love. But we also need to tell him this is what's going to happen if you don't. So we don't preach that much on hell anymore. So that's not become a popular doctrine to talk about. And what has it done to us? Well, if there is no hell, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die, right? Yep. And, and I think it needs to be preached that much more in the church today that we need to remind people of it. Uh, entire sermons on it. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. All right. <laughs> Verse 13. God says, listen, and you see, Jeremiah knows what's going to happen. He, he, he knows it because God already, has already told him. He says, but if you say we will not dwell in this land and you disobey the voice of the Lord, your God saying, no, but we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall see no war nor hear the sound of the trumpet nor be hungry for bread. And there we will dwell. Now let's stop for a moment. When God delivered them from Egyptian bondage, he said, you shall come back here again. And that's what their exact plan is. And Jeremiah knew it because God was telling him this. Is, so you tell them you are not to go back to Jews, uh, Egypt. And you're going to, you said, we will not dwell and you will go back to the land of Egypt. So hear the words. If you set your face to enter Egypt to go to dwell there, then the sword that you feared that overtake you, the famine that you were afraid of shall follow you in Egypt and there you shall die. Hmm. you're going to die in Egypt. And again, as the history tells us, that's exactly what winds up happening. Yep. So shall it be with all the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to dwell there. They will die by the sword, by the family, by pestilence. So isn't it always, this always interesting as well. Whenever God gave a lot of these warnings in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, he will talk about all the different ways that he will send punishment by the sword or by famine, you know, and by the pestilence that would come from it. <clears throat> Think about again, in, in not just America, but in, in the world today, you still got the same thing, sword, famine, pestilence. It, it just seems to be what follows man everywhere. And again, because we're not doing what God wants and what God expects. So he says, verse 18, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the Lord of the armies, as my anger and my fury have been poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so will my fury be poured out on you when you enter Egypt. And you shall be an oath, an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. And you shall see this place no more. And what happens in all of this is about, I want to, I want to check on this and make triple sure that before I tell you, I was looking at this in a, uh, they asked the question and in about the year five, this may have been about, uh, this wasn't, in other words, 586 BC was the last time they took that last group of people away and it seems like as you're reading the text it goes right after that but uh they had actually entered egypt by planning it all out according to this commentator anyway um they had actually within uh and i can't seem to find it now i might try to find it in a moment but it, it suggests the fact that it wasn't but maybe uh, 10 or 12 years, if that much, and they all wound up dying in Egypt, okay? I'm trying to see the exact date, but I'll, I'll try to find it in a minute when they take a break, all right? So there we go. And so he says, that's what's going to happen. Um, 
He said, I'm going to pour out my fury. You're going to be an oath, astonishment, a curse, a reproach, and you shall see this place no more. And the Lord has come, said concerning you, do not go to Egypt. Know certainly that I have admonished you this day. Jeremiah is like, it's still the same group, still the same hearts, still yep. the same people. And um, I, I don't know what's going to get to him. I, I don't know what else to do. And God is like, you've done your job. You've done what I wanted you to do. You can take comfort in that fact, but I want you to know that <clears throat> I understand you're not going to be held responsible for that. And he says, the Lord has said concerning you, do not go to Egypt. He says, because you will see this place no more. I haven't admonished you this day for you were hypocrites in your heart when you sent me to the Lord, your God. Now you see Jeremiah now says, God has told me about your hearts and you were hypocritical in your heart when you told me to go talk to Randy about this. Yep. So it's like, you're not getting anything over on anybody. You decided that's what you were going to do and you're going to do it no matter what. And I want you to know that I know. And I want you to know that God knows. And I want you to know that because again, you're going to do, choose to do this, something contrary to the will of God, you're going to die there. And you're going to die, not the death of old age, but you're going to be punished there. Now, later, I think, again, the date is right around 530 or something like that. Nebuchadnezzar goes down through that front land again and literally attacks Egypt and sets his throne in Egypt itself, saying, not only have I conquered all these nations up through here, but now I have conquered Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're going to pay the price as well. And he says, again, you shall no, I want you, he said, I want you to know this. And I want you to understand this. You shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go dwell. Now, <clears throat> Jeremiah has spent most of his preaching life talking about what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. As this last bit of people that are there, they could just, all they have to do is look around and say, you know, everything Jeremiah has been selling us just came true. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, uh, so I know what we'll do. We'll go down to Egypt. <laughs> Jeremiah says, uh, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Ah, uh, your words. <laughs> uh -huh. It's just like, really? <laughs> and, and I laugh at that. And, and, I, and it's a sad, sad story. But it's, doesn't that fit so many of our brethren today in so many mm -hmm. different ways? Well, I know that's what the Bible says, but, but. well, that's your interpretation of the Bible, but, but. you know, and, and, well, God is not going to really send us to a place called hell. And, and, you know, he's not going to, he's just too loving to punish us, you know, and, and, and on and on and on we go and, and, and we see these wake up calls. I can't go to the Bible and I'm not going to go anywhere in the Bible and show you where he talks about the COVID-19 beginning in 2020, it's not there. Yeah. But, but the thing is, are these wake-up calls to us? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think, I think so. That we really need to sit down and say, think about the word pestilence there. How many times through the scriptures do you read about pestilences wiping out people? Here we go again. Same song, second verse. What's God doing? He's trying to get our attention. He's just like he's trying to get their attention. And everybody said, well, a loving God won't do that. This very same God that destroyed Jerusalem is the loving God that sent his son to die upon the cross. Mm -hmm. And that hadn't changed. Nope. And the promise of hell hadn't changed. So it's, it's kind of like we don't want to listen to the word. We don't want to listen to what's being said. We don't want to listen to what's being preached. Because we just know that God is not going to do that. And so God does something to wake us up and says, where's God in all this? Where he's always been. Uh -huh. 
giving us warnings, waking us up, helping us realize what's really important in our lives and what's not. And, and, and it's just like, and I, I, I picture in my mind, and again, I see the long suffering of God, but I just picture in my mind that God's just up there shaking his head like, are you kidding me? So I, I can't judge these people. I laugh, I, I, but I can't judge these people when we're doing the same stuff, right? And, and, and I want to emphasize that my opinion, you got to start with the church and then get, get the church straightened out. And then if that's possible, <laughs> and then start working on the world, you know, yep. that's the thing to me. That's it. He, he told them these words. And Azariah, the son of Hoshia, Johanna, the son of Caria, and the, all the proud men spoke, you speak falsely. The Lord of God, our God, has not sent you to say, do not go to Egypt. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, sent you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans that they may put us to death or carry us away captive to Babylon. Their whole statement is stupid. I'm sorry. I don't know any other way to say it than that. That's just... Yeah. If he wanted you in Babylon, you'd be walking there now. You'd be on your way right now. Uh, let's not even go there. But you want to see how silly you're sounding, go ahead. But this, this makes no sense. Absolutely no sense. God has not sent you to say that, but by Ruth, the son of Neriah. So Johanan and all the captives and all the people would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. Same song, second verse from Exodus all the way till here. Yep. From about roughly 14, 14 or 12, 1200 BC to here, 586, about a thousand years mm -hmm. is how long God's dealt with those people. And he just says, no. And so they, they said, we will not obey. So they took the remnant, all that had returned to dwell in the land of Judah, from all the nations where they had been driven, that would be Edom, Moab, Ammon, maybe some already heading down to Egypt, maybe in the northern part of the land of uh, Israel that would have been occupied by the Assyrians before. Mm -hmm. They're getting everybody together, the men, women, children, the king's daughters, that's interesting. We remember his sons were slain, but his daughters weren't. And every person whom Nebuzaradan had left with Gedaliah, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch, and they went to the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they went as far as Tophanes. Now, we're not say, exactly sure where Tophanes is. I was doing a little bit of research on this um, a little bit earlier to try to figure out where a lot of these places were. Um, and part of the problem is with some of this is again, all the archeological digs, they, they said it's one place and another one was saying some other places, but yeah. it's obviously in this particular place called Tophanes, it was probably another one of the places where the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh would put his throne. So he was in charge of Northern Egypt as well as Southern Egypt. That's always been kind of interesting to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Northern Egypt was where the uh, Nile Delta is. Southern Egypt is <laughs> north of it. <there. laughs> mm -hmm. But they do that because they're looking at it from the viewpoint of the way the Nile was flowing. Oh. <laughs> Every time I've read that in the Bible, I always have to stop for a minute. Okay, it's not north and south like I understand it. It's, it's backwards. <laughs> I've always got to try to remember that. So they went down there. All right. And they went in the land of Egypt. And this was a place, obviously, where the king would go from, from certain times, maybe once a year, uh, to go conduct business in each one of these places to emphasize that he was still the Pharaoh. They mm -hmm. did not go, and they went as far as Taphanes. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and Taphanes. You take large stones in your hand, hide them in the sight of the men of Judah, in the clay, in the brick courtyard, which is at the entrance of Pharaoh's house in Taphanes, and say to them, thus says the Lord, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. We've seen this all through this. Yep. Nebuchadnezzar 
I don't think he ever knew that he was really being God's servant, but God was using him as a servant anyway. Mm -hmm. And that's an extremely interesting idea to me as well. When you see the kind of man that Nebuchadnezzar was, um, when I think about how Christians and how we all should look at government today, I think, again, it, it stresses to me anyway, the importance of really making sure that um, even if I don't agree with a particular guy, they're still God's servant. God can use the wicked to do whatever he wants done. God can use the righteous to do whatever he wants done. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I don't know about you, but sometimes I, that thought blows my mind a little bit, but that's okay. I, I can't wrap my mind all the way around God anyway. But obviously, from what we've seen over and over and over again, God does that. Right. So he says, you, you had these stones, large stones, and you had them in the clay brick courtyard. Mm -hmm. And he says, the king of Nebuchadnezzar will come and set his throne above these thrones that I have hidden. And he will spread his royal pavilion over them. He shall strike the land of Egypt and deliver to death those appointed to death, to captivity for captivity, to the sword for the sword. And I will kindle a fire in the house of the gods of Egypt. And he shall burn them and carry them away captive. He shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd puts on his garment, and he shall go out from there in peace. He shall break the sacred pillars of Beth Shemesh, which are in the land of Egypt and the houses of the gods of the Egyptians, he shall burn with fire. So again, he's taken to Egypt. Again, in all of this whole situation, God knows what's going to happen. He has predicted the future. He has Kelvin given Jeremiah the opportunity to try to get them to get their act together before it's too late. They refuse to do so. And so now, as a result, you're fleeing to Egypt if you had stayed back home, everything would have been all right, but you're fleeing to Egypt. You're going to die here. You're going to die here. Hard-hearted, obstinate people. And they're still with us today. And, and again, it's just emphasize, it just emphasizes so much to me that God is in control, that God does know what he's doing. And for that, I'm grateful. So that just builds that much more faith for me. It just builds that much more faith for me. All right. <clears throat> so chapter 44, we're rocking along tonight. Yes, sir. I'm telling you. And again, there's, there's so much stuff here that we could cover and spend a lot of time on. And again, maybe we will go back. I, this class has been a while since I taught it. So it's going a little faster than I mean for it to. <laughs> <laughs> we may go back and revisit some things that I covered quickly that I wanted to cover more in depth, but that might be something we do too. Plus we've also got the five chapters of Lamentations to look at. Right. And you've got to cop take that in consideration. All right. So we pick up at chapter 44. The word came concerning all the Jews who dwell in the land of Egypt, who dwell at Migdol, at Tophanes, at Noph, in the country of Pathros. Now, I was doing a little bit of research on this. Um, where did I have my notes? Give me a sec. All right, I'll try my best to, yeah, here we go, here we go, here we go. Um, so chapter 43, uh, chapter 44, I'm sorry. Uh, Taphanes, Okay, they went as far as Taphanes, chapter 43, verse 7, and the word of the Lord came to him in Taphanes and takes these large stones, so that's what he does, and he then says, I will break the pillars of Beth Shemesh. That was probably called Heliopolis, as we understand it today. So Beth Shemesh was probably called Heliopolis. Chapter... Okay, I'm trying to get my notes here. Okay, so when we start off, 
He's taken to Egypt. So then you have Noth. Notice that Taphanes, at Migdal, and Noth. That may have been ancient Memphis. Ancient Memphis, not the Memphis that we would understand today. So right. that's, and again, that's, think about how we have these archaeological discoveries of ancient places that kind of give us an idea where these places were at one time. But whenever you start going to comparing that with maps that have some of these very same names today, they might become what close. And then at the same time, they're nowhere near one another. So that's where we struggle with trying to figure out where all of these places are and how they all fit together. So we just do the best we can with it and try to go from there. Yeah. That says the Lord, you have seen all the calamity that I brought on Jerusalem, the cities of Judah, in this day, they are a desolation and no one dwells in there because of their wickedness. They've committed to provoke me to anger. They went to burn incense to serve other gods whom they did not know. They, nor you, nor your fathers. I sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them saying, oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate. So God is saying, look, you've seen all the calamity. You've seen what I've done. You've seen it because of their wickedness. I told you time and again with all these different prophets, do not do this, but they would not listen nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness to burn no incense to other gods. Now that's a passage that'll preach. There'll be some brother or sister in Christ that will say, well, we don't offer idols today. <laughs> well, yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> you know, Anything that gets in our way of our service to God is an idol. Yep. And what's interesting about this is that a lot of times we won't even see it. We could see, we, we can condemn the, the Buddhists. We can condemn these, these people that actually fall down before these idol gods, you know, Buddha, things along that line. We were sitting like there shaking our head, like, how can anybody be doing something like that? But we have our idols. Yep. And, and we seriously do just as much with them and worship them as we do others. And, and if you want to challenge folks on thinking about this, he says, I want you to stop for a moment and think about how much time you watch TV, yeah. how much time you spend in the Bible, how much time do you spend talking to your neighbors or your family, and how much time do you spend talking to God? Yep. You know, those kind of things may cause us to stop and think, yeah, we've got our idols. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times when I'm preaching on something like this, I'll always talk about, yeah, we've got our idols. We've got, uh, especially now with Facebook and, and um, all the different media that we have nowadays, um, everybody could follow their idol in one way yep. or another, somehow or another. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got idols of football. Um, I'm, 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 a, I'm an Alabama fan. I think I told you that at the beginning. So, you know, but I'm not going to worship Nick Saban. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> not even going to happen in a million years. No way in this world, you know, but man, that's, he's the guy. He's the guy. You know, we've got him in baseball. We've got him in football. We've uh -huh. got him. In, you name it, we've got it. Um, watch what these, some of these kids are watching nowadays. And they idolize these <clears throat> They idolize these people that are absolute perverts in a lot of situations. And I'm just being as honest as I can be about it. That's the kind of life we need to live so that we can really enjoy this life. And God's saying, no, 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 no. This isn't it. This isn't the life that I want you to have. I know that you've got something better. I'm wanting to give you something better. But trying to get that across to some people, they don't get it. We worship, we worship our possessions. We worship. I mean, if we were to sit down and write down every possible idol that man have today, uh, it would take a notebook. Yep. And, and how we worship them. And I guess I'm very fearful sometimes whenever I turn on the television or I get on Facebook and I see our younger people in the church and some of the stuff they're posting and what they're saying. And I'm asking some hard questions here. Are we really getting 
God in his word in their hearts to help them to grow and to be what they need to be. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's a big struggle. It's something I know you struggle with. All the preachers, all the elders are struggling with that right now. Why are we losing so many of our young people? Well, we might have them three or four hours a week at church. Mom and dad has them a lot more than that. If mom and dad's not doing their job. Then the world's got them. Yep. And, and then they come to us. Mom and dad come to us later and, and, uh, or we might make a statement to some of them about the way one of their children are acting. And it's like, well, you ain't got the right to tell me what to do. Yeah. I don't, but <clears throat> where is this child going to be 15, 20, 25 years from now? Will they yeah. even be in the church? That's right. And, and we need to be getting parents to think about this. Think seriously about this stuff. Because I hear all the time, well, you know, my, my child at one time was going to church. My child at one time was doing this. My child at one time was doing, where are they now? Well, they're out in the world. Well, what happened? Yeah. That didn't happen just accidentally. It was, it was a gradual thing. Same thing with the children of Israel. All those years they were in the land of Canaan. It didn't happen to them immediately. When they had good leaders, it seems like they tried to do what was right. Mm -hmm. When they had bad leaders, it seems like they tried to do what was wrong. Leadership is important. Think about leadership in the church, preachers and elders in the church and, and, and the responsibilities that we have. Are we doing the best we can? Are we giving it the best we've got? I, you know, yeah. it, it, it keeps me awake at night sometimes. It really does. And uh, especially when somebody comes and shares something and, and, and then they go out and they marry these these people that, that aren't even associated with the church, they see nothing wrong with homosexuality or, or anything else, and yeah. lead those children further away. Yeah. What can we do to change it? What, what, what can we do to make it different? I, I don't know. I, I guess that's the biggest struggle is I don't know, except continue to preach. And obviously, it's got to be more than what we do on Sundays and Wednesday nights, you know. Yeah. And how do we do it? You know, uh, what did what did God say through Deuteronomy six? He emphasized, "You teach them when they go to bed. You teach them when they get up. You teach them. You have it on the doorpost. You teach them every time you get a chance about God." And we haven't done that. We haven't done that in church. We haven't done that in the world. So that's the reason why the world is going to where it is now. And, and this yep. is the reason why we're struggling with so many things that we're doing. So it's uh, history repeats itself. And Jeremiah is just emphasizing. It, it, it just takes me stop and, and makes me pause for a few moments and thinks about the idea over and over again. We, we've got to do better. We've got to do better. Yes, sir. All right. We're back at... Uh, Let's take about a five minute break. Let me whip my whistle a minute, okay? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> we'll go from there. Let me see. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, brother. Okay. Back to chapter 44. Okay. All right. <clears throat> like I said, we're at uh, Knopf, which would have been the area of Memphis, Tophanes, the country of Pathros. Thus says the Lord, you have seen all the calamity that I brought upon them, their wickedness, which they've committed to provoke me to anger. I sent to you all my servants, the prophets rising and sending them. Do not do this abominable thing that I hate, but they would not listen. So my fury and anger will pour out and kindle in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. And they're wasted and desolate as it is this day. And, and so what we have here in chapter 43 and 44 the remnant is trying to scatter out in Egypt. No. You know, they had not escaped God, uh, but they were trying to run away from him as it was. So this God of Israel, the, the Elohim of Israel was going to make sure that he was going to get to their people. And so what he does is he says, here's the past punishment. This is what happened. I told them time and time again, don't incline, uh, do, burn these incense to other gods. So my fury, my anger were poured out, kindled in the streets, 
And that's the way it is today. So that's what happened to them before. Now let's see what's going to happen to them later. And so he go, continues to go on here and emphasize what it is. Now, he says, why do you commit this evil against yourselves? Could it be that we need to do a lot more teaching about how sin hurts us individually? You know, mm -hmm. we talk a lot, rightly so, about how sin hurts the world, the country. We talk a lot about how sin does hurts relationships, how it hurts the church. Right. Do we ever really sit down and think about how sin hurts us ourselves? And that's what I think he's trying to get at. Why do you commit this against yourselves? Why are you doing this? What, what, why, why do you cut off from yourself man and woman, child and infant, leaving none to remain? Why? Do we do that as parents sometimes with our children when we're upset? Why did you do that? You know, yeah. what motivated <clears throat> you? Couldn't you see that this was going to do and this was going to end up this way? And a lot of times they didn't because they're children. But as they grow older, you hope that they're getting enough maturity to where they can start seeing these things. But again, yeah. it's just like sometimes they revert back to two or three years old, you know, whenever they're first beginning to learn all this stuff. I'd like to say that by the time we get out of teenage situation, we're over that. But I see adults do the same thing. I mean, it's just like you keep doing the same thing and you keep expecting a different result. Uh -huh. I mean, really? <laughs> Why? What, what, what causes us to do that? I mean, it's not something God it, it, you know, put in us. It, right. It's something that we just think that we can get different results right. from doing the same things. And it just doesn't work. Yeah. It just doesn't work. And I, again, as I'm reading this passage and thinking about it, I think this, this is what God says. You're doing this to yourself. Mm -hmm. You're doing this to yourself. And, and, and you're, you're leaving nobody to remain. You are provoking me to wrath with the work of your hands, burning incense to other gods where you've, not gone, where you've gone to dwell, that you may cut yourselves off and be a curse and a reproach from all the nations of the earth. Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers? Uh, number one, we think we could do the same thing and get a different result. Number two, we forget. Yep. We forget the wickedness of the kings of Judah, the wickedness of their wives, their own wickedness. And immediately the thing that popped in my mind was Jezebel, you know, and it, yeah. her whole situation that you read about it in the book of Second Kings, the wickedness of your wives, your own wickedness. Well, I didn't see nothing wrong with that here today in <laughs> modern 21st century southern England. well i don't even see nothing wrong with that uh -huh. y'all watch this <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> oh. um, um, you do bad things you get bad results right <laughs> that's right that's all there is to it but anyway he said he says your own wickedness the wickedness of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. Now, is he talking here about uh, adultery? Very possibly. Go back and read through the book of Proverbs. One of the great books that young know, parents could use to teach their children is the book of Proverbs, obviously. Mm -hmm. And the first five chapters, I mean, he gets very explicit about young men and women and how they need to watch what they're doing and, and so forth. And so he, he clearly makes that that way and he says you know secondly it could be talking about the wickedness of their wives and the fact that we've already seen this <clears throat> uh earlier that they said you know it, it's because that we did not worship the queen of heaven mm -hmm. that all these things have happened in other words it's not because jehovah has punished us it is because we haven't done what we're supposed to do with these other idol gods um, and he says, you know what? They've not been humbled. He said, you've done this stuff in the streets, in the land of Judah, <clears throat> in the streets, and they have not been humbled to this day. This word humbled could mean, and literally this word could be translated crushed. They've not been crushed to this day. 
In other words, they've not had a great enough punishment to cause them to stop. Yeah. The 70 year Babylonian captivity did break them of idolatry. But that was about all. And, and in another sense, as I've mentioned before, it didn't because they started worshiping themselves. Yeah. Look at how well we're doing keeping this part of the law. Well, what mm -hmm. about this part? Well, as long as I'm keeping this part of the law, keeping the Sabbath day holy, then the rest of it don't count. Yeah. We've made a God on our, ourselves and saying, this counts, but this doesn't. You know, that's not going to work. Uh -uh. He says, they've not humbled. They have not been fearful. They have not walked in my law or my statutes that I set before your fathers. <clears throat> Therefore, behold, I'll set my face against you for catastrophe and for cutting off all Israel. In essence, I'm going to destroy all of Israel or Judah. And I'll take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to dwell there. And they shall be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. By the sword and by famine, they shall die from the least to the greatest. By the sword and by famine, and they shall be an oath an astonishment, a curse, and a reproach. Y'all are going to be examples, but not good examples. Yeah. And the end result of your lives are not going to be something that you're going to be proud of. In fact, people are going to look at you and say, oh, well, we don't should not be like those who perished because of their pride, because of their desire to do what they wanted to do mm -hmm. so that's when he emphasizes he says <clears throat> now listen to what he's, they say now he, he tells them like it is he said this is the way it is so none of the people that have gone from the, the remnant of judah have gone to the land shall escape to, or survive lest they return to the land of judah to which they desire to return and dwell, none shall return except those who escape. Then all the men and who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods with all the women who stood by a great multitude and all the people who dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros. So look at this, it's, it's one man against all of them. And obviously as you're reading this context here, it, it turns into, it's a bigger crowd than what we're thinking. We're not talking four or five families. We're talking about a huge multitude of people. Yeah. Um, and they said, what you've spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we're not going to listen to you. And Jeremiah probably thinks to himself, same song, second verse. Mm -hmm. Nothing's changed. Uh, they saw all the destruction of Jerusalem but they brought their hearts down to Egypt. And that's yeah. what the problem was all along. And he says, <clears throat> the men who knew their wives had burned incense to other gods. The men weren't stepping up, doing what they needed to do. They weren't being the example they needed to be in their families. They would let their wives do whatever they wanted to do. Their wives were probably perhaps running them, all the women who stood by. And they were probably sitting there saying, well, you're not going to tell me what to do. Yeah. No, I just, I see the same thing so often today, you know. <clears throat> it's a sad tragedy. It, re it really is. We will do what, we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our mouth to burn incense to the queen of heaven, to pour out drink offerings to her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of food. We're well off and we saw no trouble. No, you have mistaken. You have misunderstood. It is because you have done that, God says, that you are punished. And that's the reason why. Yeah. And so you see, They've got a convoluted way of looking at things. Now think again in our society, in our culture, wrong is not wrong is the right thing. You know, 
I was reading some meme in Facebook the other day, it said something to the effect that what used to be talked about in secret is now openly, flagrantly shown in the streets, yep. demanding their rights, you know. Um, so you, you start thinking about that for just a minute and there's so much truth to that. And, and it's kind of like, as, as we see the world or see America going down as it was, this is what's leading us to it. The history is happening all over again. We're going to make idols of ourselves. We're going to make idols out of whatever we want to. We're going to do what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And we have this newfound freedom. It's not freedom. It's captivity. Yep. We just change the names a little bit, change the wording a little bit. Then what? But it's not going to change the sin. It's not going to change the people. So he says, you know, whenever we were doing this, we, we had all that we needed. Boy, did they, did they have some problems. He says, when, since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And in the New King James Version, the next phrase, the, word all, the women also said, uh, that was added to help the text, but he says, when we burn incense to the queen of heavens and offer drink, poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cake for her to worship her, pour out drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? So the husband's quiet or the husband's not saying anything to them was perceived as permission. Uh -huh. I think about that. I think about that so often today. <clears throat> and, and other people, you know, uh, as well, well, it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> tell me, tell me that what Jeremiah was writing here is not going on in our culture and in our world today. Yeah. It, I mean, seriously, it's just, it just fits so, so vividly. And that's what's so sad about all of this. He says, our husbands gave us, they didn't say anything against us. So obviously what? We're okay. Yeah. Jen Jeremiah spoke to all the people, men, women, all the people who were giving him that answer. The incense that you burn in the cities of Jeru Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and did it not come to his mind? So the Lord could no longer bear it. That'll preach. Yep. that'll preach that is something and we need to get across to the church there comes a point where god can no longer bear it he can't put up with it anymore how far will a nation have to go before it has to be punished you know you, you think about i think about the children of israel when they left in the land of egypt it depends on which way you you date the book 1400 BC or 1290 something BC, you got about a hundred year difference. Until now, whenever you think about all their wickedness and all their captivities and so forth, whenever they left the land of Egypt and they're now here in Babylonian captivity, how many years was that? How many years? If you're looking at, let's say, let's take the most conservative estimate that the Exodus happened at 1290 BC. Okay. And now we're at 586 BC. Maybe five, 600 years. But these people were up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Yep. All right. Look at the history of nations today. Most nations do not last that long. The Roman Empire lasted from what we understand maybe four or 500 years. The children of Israel lasted longer only because God was with them, protecting them, trying to get them to do what was right. Uh, we've been here pushing 300, you know. Yeah. So there comes a point when God says, no, I'm not going to put up with yeah. it. Does America need to hear that? Yeah. Does the church need to hear this? Yeah. Yeah. I think it needs to start first in the church. Mm -hmm. Because everything we're reading about right here 
It's to God's people. That's right. It's to God's people first. So he says, when he couldn't bear it anymore, because of the evil of your doings, because of the abominations you committed, your land is a desolation, an astonishment, a curse, without an inhabitant as it is this day. Because you have burned incense, and because you have sinned against the Lord, and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord in his statutes, his testimony, this calamity has happened to you. Let's talk about you saying it's because you're not worshiping the queen of heaven. It's because you're not listening to God, and you're not doing what God says. <clears throat> and so he says, you and your wives have spoken, verse 25, your mouths have fulfilled with your hands. We will surely keep our vows that we might burn incense to the queen of heaven, pour out drink offerings to her. You're going to keep them and you will perform your vows. Hmm. And God says, hear the word of the Lord. All of you who dwell in the land of Egypt, I've sworn by my great name, says the Lord. Now, what is his great name? Well, that's a whole other study for a while. The, the name Elohim, which suggests God Almighty. Yahweh, which is the one he really wanted to get across to them to suggest that he was a personal God that cared deeply about them. So he said, by this, I swore, and think about it, God can swear by nothing greater than who he is, right? That's right. <clears throat> we, a lot of times, if we're... <clears throat> In a court of law, uh, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God? That's kind of the idea that's going on here. God is saying, I can't swear nobody, by nobody greater than me. So here it is. You know, I've sworn by my name that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Egypt, of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying the Lord God lives. I'll watch over them for adversity and not for good. So you guys think you have fled impossible problems going to Egypt, you're going to have problems here. Yeah. You're going to perish here. And, and the bottom line is <clears throat> you who are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword, by famine until there is an end to them. Yet again, notice again, this, this idea, a small number who escape shall return from the land of Egypt to the land of Judah. Everywhere God sent these people, he, he had a remnant left and he had a desire to bring them back. I just, I just continue to be amazed at that. You know, I just continue to think about how long God's long suffering and mercy and grace will go. And, and, and I'm just, I just continue to be amazed at this every time I open the Bible. Um, there was going to be some that's going to left. And then he says, those who escaped shall know these words will stand. Mine or theirs. There comes a point where God is going to verify his word. And then he's going to look at all these other things and all this other commotion and ado and all these other words out there that's being said. And he says, okay, what is the truth? What is the truth? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So when we put our faith and trust in Jesus, that's where, that's where it needs to stay. He says, they shall know, and this shall be a sign, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know my words will surely stand against you for adversity. I will give Pharaoh hop for king of Egypt into the hand of his enemies into the hand of those who seek his life. And I give, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the land, hand of Bab Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy who sought his life. And that was the thing I was trying to mention a few moments ago. He said, I'm going to give Pharaoh hop front into the hand of his enemies. Mm -hmm. His enemy was going to be Nebuchadnezzar. And he, they were going to see it. And they were going to know. Yep. They were going to know. So, Chapter 46 is going to pick this up in a lot more detail. And he's going to emphasize this idea a lot more. But let's go on to chapter 45. Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in the instruction of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim. Now, notice this. The fourth year of Jehoiakim. 
we have just gone from the passages we've been looking at, interestingly enough, we have just talked about the destruction of Jerusalem mm -hmm. in 586. Jehoiakim was the son of Josiah. So here you have this little chapter here in the midst of all of this, in the midst of this whole destruction, in the midst of them going down to Egypt. It's like Jeremiah goes back and says, okay, now let's talk talking about some of these other players in the book. And one of them was Baruch. Baruch was yeah. the son of Neriah. He was <clears throat> Jeremiah's scribe. And he says, here's what God says to you, Baruch. You say, woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down. What I have planted, I will pluck up the whole land. He says, do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. I'll bring adversity on all flesh, but I'll give your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. So Baruch was facing some problems. Mm -hmm. He was facing some difficulties as well. And so he was, you know, Lord, are you going to let me die or what? And he says, you know, I'm going to bring adversity on all flesh, but I'm going to give you your life. You're going to live. And that's all you needed right now. Yeah. When, when it comes down to living, we think about all of our possessions. You know, I, I look around here and think about this computer I'm talking on, you know, mm -hmm. uh, my all my bibles all these books i've got all the car a couple of cars one for me and my wife the, the house itself and and i know that i'm richly blessed i know that i'm richly blessed uh, but he emphasizes the idea that sometimes if you escape with your life that's an even greater blessing right yep and baruch you need to understand that and so you know that's it, whenever you're going through these kind of judgments, when you're going through these kind of struggles, you have to keep those kind of things in perspective. Now, chapter 46, beginning in chapter 46 and going through chapter 51, which is about five more chapters, he's going to start like in every other prophetic book. He's going to start talking about God's judgment on all the nations that had anything to do with Israel. He's going to talk about Egypt. He's going to talk about Babylon. He's going to talk about judgment on, on all of these nations that had anything to do with Israel. This happens just about in every prophetic book in one way, somehow or another. So this is what we're getting down to here. So he starts off again against Egypt concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho. Okay, now wait a minute. Earlier in chapter 44, we had just got finished talking about Pharaoh Hophra, which was many years before this. Or Pharaoh Hophra, excuse me, had died because of Babylon there. Here is Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, by the, which was by the river Euphrates and Carchemish, which he defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. So that would have been about the year 597. Again, it's not chronological. We, this is what kind of blows my mind. I always like things chronological. I always read things yeah. chronologically. We, we do that. And, but as I've mentioned before, he's putting things together, not by chronology, as much as by events. And one thing would just be the ideal of another thing that would be an ideal of another thing. I wonder sometimes you know, we are slave, and I may have mentioned this before, we are slavish when it comes to watching the time. Um, we are. We are. We really are. And one of the things that I've often looked at as I've gone through the Bible is that time is not all that. I mean, he gives us day and night and things like that, but time is not all that important to God. The exact events unfolding as we want them to, that's not important to God as much as we get the main point and we get how this happened here, but it also happened here, here, and here. And history is, is repeating itself and just different, just change the names of the nations. And so that's, that's kind of the thing that I get as I'm reading this uh, at, at these different times. So order the buckler and the shield and draw near to battle. All right, so here you have set in order. So they're setting all these soldiers in order, the buckler, the shield, 
They harness the horses, heart mount up you horsemen, stand forth with your helmets, polish the spears, put on the armor. So here you have armies getting ready to battle. It's not like, again, <laughs> they didn't have call in airstrikes. You know, <laughs> they didn't have howitzers. They didn't have um, guns that could shoot a, a missile, you know, two or three or for, the, for that matter, 2,000 or 3,000 miles away. They didn't have that. Right. So they got together. I mean, you could see the soldiers. You could see them putting on their helmets, the spears, the horsemen. Why the have I seen them dismayed and turned back? The mighty ones are beaten. They have speedily fled. They did not look back. Fear was all around. Do not let the swifts flee away. The mighty man escape. They will stumble and fall toward the north by the river Euphrates. So here you have where this battle is going to be fought. He, he's talking about this here. And where it is, is toward the north by the river Euphrates. Mm -hmm. Now, in this poetic language, he then says, who is coming up like a flood? Now, it's interesting that he would be talking about the Euphrates River, the Tigris and Euphrates would flood. So now you have the image of armies flooding a certain area. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. Egypt is rising up like a flood. So who is rising up? It's Egypt. They're getting everybody together. And they said, we're going to cover the earth. And I'll destroy the cities and the inhabitants. Come, horses, rage, chariots. Now I could just vision in my mind. And maybe, and again, because we don't hear it in the Hebrew, uh, maybe this was somewhat of a song that as they're singing this, you could you can visualize in your mind. The way I kind of look at it sometimes is watching a Western and you've got the cavalry about to attack the Indians, you know. Yeah. And you hear the you hear the bugle blows and you hear all you have all of these guys and horses coming all together. That's what I visualize when I'm hearing this thing. And so that's kind of like the same thing. It, it, Egypt is rising up like a flood. How appropriate the Nile floods every they they relied upon the Nile to flood every year to feed them. So he says it that's what it is. I will go and cover the earth. But what happens? The Ethiopians came with them, the Libyans who handle the shield, the Lydians who handle and bend the bow. This is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance that he may avenge himself on his adversaries, not just his own people, but other nations as well. The sword shall devour. Now he pictures it, he, he personifies it, right? The short sword is eating everything. It comes into place. It, it's satiated. It's filled to the full and made drunk with their blood. The Lord God of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. Okay, well, who sides winning yeah egypt is going there with a flood they're going toward the north they've got this army coming and i think that's what he's talking about verses 1 through 12 so go up to gilead take balm virgin the daughter of egypt you will use many medicines you will not be cured the nations have heard of your shame your cry has filled the land the mighty man has stumbled against the mighty and they have fallen together battle neither side's winning and so now god says nebuchadnezzar is going to come and strike the land of egypt so it, it may very well be that egypt think about what was happening after the assyrians had taken over the assyrians had taken babylon and we remember that babylon was under assyrian domination for many, many years. It wasn't until the time of Nebuchadnezzar's father that Nebuchadnezzar, that he attacked the Assyrians, drove them out of Babylon, and he spends the rest of his time rebuilding Babylon, getting rid of all that, and he puts his sons in charges of battles against the Assyrians. That battle, though, they're going to continue to battle for, for a few years until Nebuchadnezzar comes on the scene, and he puts it into it all. I mean, he defeats the Assyrians once and for all. That's it. Yeah. Now you've got the 10 northern tribes, Israel, who 
would have been sending troops to the Assyrians because they were vassal kings under the Assyrians. So now not only does Nebuchadnezzar have to deal with them, but, well, excuse me, the Assyrians took the, the children of Israel, the 10 northern tribes into captivity. So now all that's left was Judah. So let me get that straight. I knew there was something wrong when I said it. <laughs> the bottom line is, so now Judah is going to have to deal with Babylon. And so they send their armies. And in the meantime, they also are hoping that the Egyptians will help them. Think about how on a two or three occasions, Josiah and others had appealed to the Egyptians for help in defeating their common foes. And e Egypt and others would have come to help them. So the, the tragedy of it was, is that Babylon is now going to come back and strike Egypt because of Egypt's help in the land of Canaan. So they've got that war going on there. So here you have this judgment on Egypt. It wasn't until later after all the events, he first defeats, as I said, the area defeated by the Assyrians. And then he starts taking over um, in three different take 606, uh, 597, 586, those, those three dates, he starts taking the land of Canaan. And who do the land of, who do the kings of the land of, of uh, Judah go to? They try to go to the Egyptians. Can you help us out? The last good king that lived, Josiah, was killed in a battle. Mm -hmm. Battle of Carchemish with the Egyptians against the Babylonian forces. And then all these other kings after him, all of his sons took over after him and they just drove the nation into the ground. Yep. So here you have declaring Egypt, declaring not Fentaphanes, not again would be uh, Memphis, ancient Memphis, and Taphanes. Stand fast to prepare yourselves for the sword devours all around you. While your valiant men swept away, they did not stand because the Lord drove them away. So again, who's really in charge here? It's God. You know, one thing that I'd, I'd love to sit down and do some studying on, and I haven't, I, I've thought about it so often, and I thought about writing a paper on it just for my own benefit, but <clears throat> we often brag about our country. We mm -hmm. brag about how great it is. And don't get me wrong, I love the United States. I often think about the fact how we, we become arrogant like every other nation on the face of the earth. And we get to thinking we've done this by ourselves. Yep. The revolution in the 1700s to kick Britain out, that was our doing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, religion was playing a role in that at that point in time, that God would help, do, help the colonists get rid of the bad, evil British empire, right? Mm -hmm. The War of 1812, they had to fight it again, all over again. And then Britain said, enough's enough, I'm tired. We build our own. Then we fight with ourselves, right? Civil war. And then we've been fighting wars ever since. Yep. In our own, <clears throat> after World War II, we said, you know what? That's not going to happen again. We're not going to be attacked on our soil again. I appreciate that, but then September 11th happened. Yeah. And so here we go. So we spent the last 20 years in Afghanistan. And we got and gave it all back. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I'm just, okay. I'm not going to say, but one of the things that gets me a lot is. <clears throat> And maybe you can help me figure it out. It's something that I've done a lot of study on. Lipscomb and some of these other men wrote about um, during the Civil War, saying it's wrong for a Christian to engage in war. Uh, it's wrong for them to serve as police officers. I've had three sons been serving as police officers. Uh, so I've got a very special place in my heart for them. <clears throat> Uh, still got one doing it right now. I guess the thing that I'm wondering about is just, just how much does my vote count? Just how much does, does my carrying on about politics, how much is that really helping? If God's going to do what God's going to do, then 
I want to be on the side of what's right. Yep. But at the same time, what is God saying is right? You know what I'm trying to say? Do you, yeah. Have you ever had those struggles mm -hmm. when going to a voting booth and trying to figure this whole thing out? There was a period of time when I didn't vote at all. I said, enough's enough. I'm done. I'm just, I'm just done. And then Reagan ran. And I said, okay, well, this guy might be, and I've voted ever since. Right. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I know I hear the preaching. <laughs> One vote makes all the difference. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself a lot of times, does it really? If God is the one who sets up kings and brings them down and everything, is it become am I am I prideful in saying that, you know, I helped elect that guy to be the president? <laughs> you know, kind of like I'm in charge. I, I don't know. I've I'm weird. <laughs> I sit and think about this kind of stuff a lot of times, and I'm like. I don't know if I ever will get an answer on that one. You know, yeah, I, I, I was thinking like that is kind of like, you know, with college football, you know, Auburn, I'm an Auburn fan. You're an Alabama fan. Auburn couldn't win without me pulling for him. You know that, right? Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. I mean, so I, I know what you're talking about. And there was a time as far as politics that, you know, I was like, man, we got to be all over this and, you know, we got to be ahead turning the tide here and we got to be turning the tide there and i've about come to the conclusion that ne neither side really cares about me Amen. or Amen. or anything and i just i've gotten to the point where i have to leave it in god's hands because if i sit and watch the news uh my wife would tell you i i can't watch very much news <laughs> I just can't. I'm with you, brother. I'm with you 100. percent And that's me. I can't either. But I know. I but I'm like you. I've always voted. Yeah. You know. And I'm I'm one of those guys that feels like you know if I want to have the right to voice my opinion about how things are going, then I should have at least went out there and put my vote in. Mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, but I don't know how much good it does. <laughs> 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 and I guess because I'm looking so much here at Jeremiah and I see Ezekiel and I see Daniel, I see these godly men in ungodly situations yep. with ungodly politics, with ungodly kings that they have no control over whatsoever who's going to be the king next and, yep. and God still using all of them. And, you know, you read passages such as Daniel where he says he raises kings and he brings down kings. He raises kingdoms and brings them down. And I'm sitting there thinking, so my little squeaky little vote has what kind of impact, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. I, but, but I understand what you're saying there in that respect. And I, I just, I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever come to a definite understanding of this. I, I don't know that I ever will. I do believe that God is in charge. I believe that God used Nebuchadnezzar. I believe that God used Egypt. I believe God used every nation that's ever been on this earth from the very beginning of time until now. I yep. believe he brings them kings. I believe he brings them down. I just wonder sometimes just how far Christians need to go. Should we be out there fighting these battles uh, on Facebook and so forth over things that's not really going to change things? Yeah. You know, uh, Facebook isn't going to change nothing. Number one, number two, you know, abortion has been abortion and uh, I am 100,000% against it. Yeah. But is it going to change anything? Probably not. No, I don't think so because that's, it's ingrained in us. You know, I, I just get, I get, I get aggravated and I just, I read this and I see where they went and and I'm just like you, God, you're in charge. I've done what I could. I want to make sure I'm on your side. I, that's all that matters. I just want on your side. And Lord, I'm not going to sit there and divide a church over in a church that's got Democrat and Republicans both in it. 
I'm not going to divide a church over this kind of stuff, but Lord, at the same time, what do you do? Yeah. You know, I wonder if during the times that the Israelites had these kings, did they rejoice when one king took over? Were they regretting it a couple of years later? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even their most beloved king. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, I, and I, I'm sharing with you my heart because, like I said, it's something I've really, I keep struggling with this in my own mind and in my own heart. So I'm going to keep trying to do the best I can with what knowledge I have. But again, it's, it's to me, it's like, okay, all right. God preserved Israel through all of this. Yep. He judged, he judged Babylon. He judged Assyria. He judged Egypt. He judged Ammon, Moab, the Philistines, you name it. He judged them all. He's going to judge them all. He's going to judge this nation just like he's judged other nations. Mm -hmm. And I just want to be on his side. Amen. I get on the politic bandwagon or not. That's a whole other issue. And, and maybe it's not something that we need to be sitting here discussing, but at the same time, it's a struggle that I have in my mind. So yeah. there, there it is. I hear you. So I'm, I'm glad. No, I'm not the only one. <laughs> 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 and I still love you, brother, even though you do sport Auburn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I tell everybody at, at church, somebody's got to pull for them. I mean, <laughs> somebody's got to. So, you know, I'm, I'm that guy. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, do. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Oh. I remember growing up in Alabama. I never could. We'd have that Alabama Auburn game. They said, "What side are you on?" I said, "My dad didn't watch football. He yeah. didn't." Yeah, so I don't care. Right? You don't care. <laughs> That's sacrilege in Alabama. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna catch it from both sides. <laughs> That's right. You gotta pick a sign. <laughs> you gotta do something. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Oh. All right. A little levity. That that helps us. All right. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. That's right. <laughs> All right. So the Egyptian says, let's go back to our own land. <laughs> Verse 16. To the land of our nativity from the oppressing sword. They cried there, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, is but a noise. He has passed by the appointed time. Notice mm -hmm. there, he's just the noise. <laughs> he's not yeah. making any difference at all. Babylon is going to eat his lunch, and that's that's all there is to it. He's just he's just making a noise. That's all that's going on, and he yep. has passed his appointed time, so he will die. So as I live, says the king, the Lord of Hosts, the King. Notice that. <clears throat> Surely as Tabor is among the mountains and Carmel by the sea, so shall he come. You daughter dwelling in Egypt, prepare yourself to go into captivity. For again, Noth, which again yep. is Memphis, Memphis, is waste and desolate without an inhabitant. Egypt is a very pretty heifer, but destruction comes. It comes from the north. Also, her missionaries are in her midst like fat bulls. So her mercenaries would be, again, Babylon coming from the north. They're turned back. They fled away together. They did not stand, he said, for the day of their calamity has come upon them, time of their punishment, their noise. So she's a pretty heifer, but what's happening? All these people, are, all these animals are, as it was, going to come and get her. Yeah. Her noise shall be like a serpent. They shall march with an army and come against her with axes like those who chop wood. They shall cut down our forest. It cannot be searched because they are innumerable. They're more numerous than grasshoppers. The daughter of Egypt shall be ashamed. She shall be delivered into the hand of the people of the north. So they went to Egypt to escape the captivity. They're going to Egypt and Egypt is going to be destroyed or punished as well. And you're going to receive that end of the punishment. If you had stayed, where we told you to, yep. they would have gone through your land. You would have seen the armies again, but they would not have harmed you. And so here you have God's punishment on Egypt and on those people that went there. So he said, I will bring punishment on Amon of No. Amon of No, 
So this would be the sun god of Thebes. You had earlier him talking about Memphis. Now he's talking about Thebes. Mm -hmm. And Pharaoh and Egypt were their gods and their kings, Pharaoh and those who trust in him. And I will deliver them into the hands of those who seek their lives, the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the hand of his servants. And afterwards, it will be inhabited as in the days of old. So here now you have Egypt being living again. Mm -hmm. Now, Egypt obviously is one of the oldest nations on the earth. Yeah. And, and when you start thinking about that in a lot of detail, that it's a, it's a staggering thought how long Egypt has been around. Um, we read of it even in the book of Genesis already. Mm -hmm. So probably one of the oldest cultures ever. Wow. That is just something that, but he said it shall be inhabited. So I think about till today, you know, and there was a time when the United States was fighting with Israel against Egypt, you know, given sending our forces over there trying to, or mainly our planes and so forth like that for the Israelis. Uh, I, I just continue to think about how years, you know, all these years before this place was going through all of this, wars have been fought all over that land so mm -hmm. many thousands of times. And we can't even begin to imagine it. So what does he say? <clears throat> but do not fear, my servant Jacob. Don't be dismayed, Israel. I will save you from afar, from your offspring, from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, and be at ease. No one shall make him afraid. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, for I am with you. I will make a complete end of all the nations to which I have driven you. So as you're looking at this, even in the midst of this, what is God saying? He's saying, I'm going to bless you, Israel. Yep. Now, a lot of people will go to passages such as these, and especially in Ezekiel, mm -hmm. and start being the premillennial doctrines that God is going to bless Israel again, give them the land of Canaan again, rebuild the temple again. Mm -hmm. Entire doctrines have been built on this philosophy, premillennialism. Uh, that, that whole entire doctrine, that's enough for an 18-week study in and of itself. All the different shades of it. Um, we have some even in the church today that are somewhat premillennial. And you've got to be careful about this. Uh, I remember whenever I was a young boy, uh, and if I told you this before, forgive me, uh, that I read The Late Great Planet Earth. And I thought, wow, this is it. This, this is the thing, you know. And I bought it at the Planet Sinker. And then come to the realization thankfully that i that i had the chance to be st I studied out of that right and, and but it's it's this is where people are get these ideas from these passages and the thing that he's trying to remember and trying to emphasize in all of these is not that he's going to set up another earthly kingdom but a spiritual kingdom the spiritual israel that's us that's what paul will talk about in the book of romans that we are the israel of god now and that the Israel of God that God wants are the ones that are serving him with their hearts and their obedience to the gospel. Paul makes that clear in Romans. That forever settles that argument. Yeah. But this is where so many of those people get these ideas. And so we have to make an end of that. He said, I will not make a complete end of you. So we are the children of Israel today. I will rightly correct you. I'm grateful for that. Because as a father loves their children, they're going to correct their children because that's what's best for the child. Our Heavenly Father loves us enough to correct us. And I'm grateful for that. Amen. I don't like the chastening. <laughs> we remember that the Hebrew writer will say no chastening at, going through it at the present time is, is comfortable, but <laughs> it's necessary. So he says, I will not leave you unpunished. Okay, so you will be punished if you do things wrong, but at the same time, you need to do what's right. The next phrase or the next group is the judgment on Philistia. Mm -hmm. Now the Philistines have always been a thorn in Israel's side. We remember David and Goliath. 
Mm-hmm. That whole battle back in the, in the book of First Samuel chapter 7. Uh, the Philistines have been on that in that country for all those years. God had used the Philistines on numerous occasions to punish his people. Mm-hmm. Did you notice or have you noticed as you go through scripture that God will use Edom? He will use Moab. He will use Ammon. He will use Philistia. He will use Egypt. He will use all these people all the way around to try to punish them in some way or another to get them to come back. So yeah. it goes back again to the ideas we talked about a few moments ago. Um, he said, the waters rise out of the north. Notice again, here was the north. So it's going to be coming down from the Euphrates, coming down. They shall be an overflowing flood. So here you have the army of Nebuchadnezzar coming on like a flood. Mm-hmm. They shall overflow the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in. Then the men shall cry and all the inhabitants of the land shall wail. Stabbing hooves, strong horses, and the rushing of his chariots the rumbling of his wheels. The fathers will not look back for their children. I can encourage that's, that's, you think about it. They're, they're being chased down in the street and they're so busy worrying about getting away from the people themselves. They're not even thinking about their children. Hmm. They, they've turned their back on their children because of the day that comes to plunder all the Philistines to cut off from Tyre and Sidon, every helper who remains for the Lord shall plunder the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Capthor, Cappadocia. Baldness has come upon Gaza. Ascalon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long will you cut yourself? So there's that phrase that we see a lot where God would tell his people not to cut the edges of their beard, Leviticus. And again, the idea of cutting, showing their sorrow. Mm-hmm. He says, this is what's happening with Philistia. They're being punished. How long are you sword of the Lord? How long until you're quiet? Rest and be still. Put yourself into its scabbard. Lord, how long is it going to be as you continue to punish these nations? And then God asked, how can it be quiet? Seeing the Lord has given it a charge against Ashkelon and the seashore. There he has appointed it. So the Philistines were up that on that <clears throat> western side of the children of Israel on the seashore. Mm-hmm. He said they're going to have to be punished because of what they've done. So all of these places, the Philistines, the Tyre and Sidons, and, and I briefly talked about that last week as you look at that on a map. Then Moab. Moab. Mm-hmm. One of the descendants of Lot, Wood and Ebo is plundered. Kirjath Jam is shamed and taken. The stronghold is shamed and dismayed. No more praise of Moab. In Heshbon, they devise evil against her. Come, let her cut off as a nation. You shall be cut down, madmen. Oh, madmen. Okay. All righty. A sword shall pursue you. A voice of crying shall be from Horonaim, plundering and great destruction. I think what he's doing here in this part from verses one and two and three, where he emphasizes, oh, mad men, I think he's making a uh-huh. play on Hebrew words here, where this word of Heshbon and, and so forth would be along the same line of what we're saying there. Let's see the word here. Um, let's see, see the high, high stronghold is Miss Gab, the city of Moab, um, verse two. Again, uh, you shall be cut down, Horonaim. So the idea of madmen and Horonaim kind of sounds the same, I believe, in the Hebrew. So he's making a play on words here. Okay. Okay. So he says the word, and then he says it again in a different, slightly different tone with a slightly different enunciation. And then it becomes madmen. Moab is destroyed. Her little ones have caused a cry to be heard in the ascent of Lulith. They ascend with continual weeping and the descendants of Horonaim. Again, the enemies have heard a cry of destru- destruction. So here you have Moab being destroyed again, obviously, by <clears throat> Babylon and so forth. Now, I mentioned earlier that some of them did run to Babylon or, to, excuse me, to Moab to flee from them. I don't know that 
from what I've read, I'll, I'll study it again, but I don't know that Babylon totally took over Moab or Ammon or even Edom for that point. I do know that they attacked Edom and I'm pretty sure they, pretty, they took Edom, but I'm not sure about Moab and Ammon. I'm not sure that they were all that concerned about those other two little nations because they were just little nations. They would have been, you, you know, if you're, you're facing down a bulldog and you're, you've got a little yapping puppy, the puppy ain't gonna matter a whole lot at that moment in time, yeah. <laughs> right? And I think that's kind of what's going on here. They're not so worried about them. And this is why some of the people do flee to Moab and Ammon and Edom to get away from the destruction of Babylon. Um, so that's it. But God is still saying, like he does in these other contexts, he says, you know what? All these other nations are going to be judged just like I'm judging them. All right. <clears throat> and then he says, save your lives. Be like the juniper in the wilderness. You've trusted in your works and your treasures. Again, how many nations trust in our works and our treasures? Okay. Her priest and her princes together. No one shall escape. The valley shall perish. The plain shall be destroyed as the Lord has spoken. <clears throat> Give wings to Moab that she may flee and get away. Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. And cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. I've heard that passage taken out of context. And I actually heard a sermon on that once before. You know, mm -hmm. cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. You know, but what is he talking about? The one who's doing the work of the Lord secret deceitfully is the one who's keeping back his sword from blood, sword bloodshed. He's the one not punishing the others. No. So even God is saying, you can sin. <laughs> you could be doing the work of the Lord in punishing others, but you're not doing it because you're keeping back the sword from blood. Moab has been at ease from his youth. He settled on his dregs. He's not emptied from vessel to vessel. He has not gone into captivity. His taste and his scent remain the same. And he said, the days are coming <clears throat> that I will send him like wine workers who will tip him over and empty his bottles and break the bottles. What's he doing? The dregs are coming up and he's turning it all over. The house would be, or the house of Israel is ashamed of Bethel, their confidence. How can we say we are mighty and strong for war? Moab has plundered and gone from her cities. Her chosen men have gone down to the slaughter, says the king, who's the name of hosts. The calamity of Moab is near at hand. His afflictions come, bemoan him. How strong the staff broken, the beautiful rod. Come down from your glory and sit and thirst. The plunder of Moab has come against you, has destroyed your strongholds. Ask him who flees, her who escapes, what has happened, Moab is shamed for he's broken down. The judgment has come, Holon, Jaza, Nap, Mep, Mephath, Kiriath, Jaim, Kerjathim, all the cities of the lands of Moab, the horn is broken and his arm is broken. Why? He's made, exalted himself against the Lord. He wallows in his vomit. He shall be a derision. Was not Israel a derision to you? So part of the reason why they were being judged. So obviously I've got to repent of what I said earlier, but the fact that I wasn't sure Moab was totally destroyed like the others, but he's, this whole thing seems to suggest that they were, but what? Yeah. So I apologize for that. <laughs> <clears throat> We've heard the pride of Moab. All right. <clears throat> why was Moab punished? Here's the first reason. Verse 27. Was not Israel a derision to you? And he says, you who dwell in Moab, you shall be like the dove which makes her nest in the side of the cage. <laughs> we heard the pride of Moab. So number one, Israel was a derision to you. Secondly, you have the pride of Moab. He's exceedingly proud. His loftiness and arrogance and pride and the haughtiness of his heart. So again, one of the great lessons is his pride goes before destruction, right? All right. <clears throat> this was happening to me last week, <clears throat> right about this time. <laughs> My voice was given. <laughs> it said, enough's enough. Okay. All right. All right. So then thirdly, he said, I know Moab's wrath. Verse 30. It is not right. His lies have been made nothing right. Therefore, I will wail for Moab. 
I will cry out for all Moab. <clears throat> I will mourn for the men of Kerath or Kerahiris. So he said, I'm going to weep for you. Your plants have gone to sea. They've reached the Sea of Jazer. Plunder has fallen on all your summer fruit, your vintage. I will cause the wine to fail from the wine presses. No joyous shouting from the cry of Heshman to Elielay and to Jahaz. They have uttered their voice from Zor to Horonaim like a three-year-old heifer. I will cause to cease in Moab the one who offers sacrifices, burns incense to his gods, my heart shall wail like flutes from Moab, and <clears throat> therefore the riches they have acquired have perished. Every head be bald, beard clipped. There's that beard being clipped again. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that fascinates me. <laughs> I don't know why I, I get that, but okay, all right. I have broken Moab like a vessel in which is no pleasure. There's They shall wail. She is broken down. She's turned her back. So Moab shall be a derision and a dismay to all those around her. <clears throat> and he describes how quick Moab is going to be destroyed, like an eagle flying. The strongholds are surprised. The mighty men's hearts are what? Like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Mm -hmm. Moab shall be destroyed as a people mm -hmm. because he exalted mm -hmm. against the Lord. Fear, the pit, the snare shall be upon you. He who flees from the fear shall fall into the pit. He who flee, gets out of the pit shall be caught in the snare. Those who have stood under the shadow of Heshman because of exhaustion. But a fire shall come out of Heshman. A flame from the midst of Sihon shall devour the brow of Moab. Woe to you. Your sons have been taken captive and your daughters. Yet I will bring back the captives of Moab. So God still cared about them. All that 46 verses talking about how bad things were for them. And then he says, what? I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bring you back. Just like I'm going to bring my people back. Yeah. <clears throat> All righty. Let's stop there. And probably right. next week, we'll probably get through the rest of Jeremiah. What I've decided I'm going to do, I've still, we've still got a few weeks, obviously. But uh, we've still got to cover Lamentations. But what okay. I'm going to do after we cover these, I've kind of gone over it there, and I'll try to go back and hit some very big, important points as we've gone through it a little bit. Okay. And if you've got a point that you want to discuss, if you've got something that you want to sit down and, and chew on, then um, bring it up and give okay. us a chance to, to share it a little bit more rather than okay. me just going reading through it and making my comments, this would be an opportunity for us to learn from one another. Okay. okay. So that okay. sounds like a good thing for me and you both, and, and it'll help me the next time I'll use, <clears throat> I'm an equal opportunity thief. I use whatever material <laughs> I can get any way I can get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, try, I try to let folks know that this is not all my thinking, but, mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, is that, I've got so much material. I don't even know where I've got a lot of it from anymore. Uh -huh. so that's I'm going through stuff on my file cap. And um, so, you know, and I was reading something from, from some group the other day saying that if you use somebody else's material, you need to give them credit or it's plagiarism. And I see the point, but I, I, and I believe the point and, and I'm going to preach the point. Well, at the same time, there's stuff I've used, obviously, that I don't even know where I got it from. Well, exactly. Yeah. You hear something in a sermon, you, you know, just yeah. it sticks with you and you don't know where you got it from. <laughs> that's true. That's true. And that's, that's, and you use it. And so then you're, but I've often thought about the idea that plagiarism, Plagiarism is something we should not be engaged in. I'm, I want to make that clear. We need to give credit where credit's due. But what if we don't, you know, our whole entire language has been built off of former languages and, and so forth like that. And how, how far does this go? Yeah. You know, um, I understand. I, I'm going to be doing, writing a, an article for on, on the subject of peace. Well, I'm not the only one that's thought about peace and so forth, but 
Right. I would use probably, you could probably find 5 million articles on peace somewhere down the line. And like mm-hmm. you yourself said, you might have heard something that just stuck with you, but you don't remember the time or the place or anything else, but you remember the, that. So it's a struggle. It's a struggle that um, I understand where they're coming from, but at the same time, like uh, if I had to tell everybody every place I got every bit of this information from, you'd have 2,000 footnotes and one, two sentences. <laughs> right (laughs) seriously (laughs) seriously so that that's it brother i appreciate you and i'm going to be continuing to pray for you and your family and if there's anything else i can do you let me know and um you mean a lot to me and again i appreciate it we have after this week we have one two we've got five more five more lessons okay so as i said we've gone through it a little bit quicker than I want to. I've covered some stuff that I did try to drill down on, but the things that I really want to drill down on, maybe I I can, we can work it out that way. Okay. Sounds great. Let me know. Okay. You've got in your mind. All right. Appreciate you brother. And if there's anything I can do, you know, you've got my phone number and everything else. Give me a call. All right. Same here. All right, brother. You take care. All right. We'll talk at you later. Good night. Good night.